like a lot of good things in life, you only know how much you enjoy the tour when it's gone. Hope and I remember the words of the new songs. <laughs> I'd like to think that in the end I've got to do in 100% Chris Rea and that it had an effect. I first came here to see Simple Minds. I think it was 1990. And the last time I played here was 94. And I really didn't think we'd ever be playing it again. Definitely not at my age now. But thank God we're still here. play music because I love music. That's what I do on a day off. I feel as if I haven't had a shower, if I haven't played some music before I actually go into the world for that new day. Everything had gone the way I would like it to have gone. I would have been a guitar player. There would have been a singer, and I'd have written stuff for that band, and it would have been a band. Because of the voice, I was forced into Chris Ree, the singer. You'd be surprised how many people, even now, have come out of some of these gigs we're doing. They go, do you know, I never had the clue that you play guitar like that.
city of the Bahamas. I'm a man who does Nassau. know. Correct. But now we have to know the capital city of Bolivia. We've been there and all men haven't we? Yeah. Now take us, that's La Paz. We'd like to know the capital city of El Salvador. San Salvador. Correct. This is, believe it or not, a technical thing. <laughs> uh, while he's speaking into the microphone, uh, Simon out front is testing the consonants and the equalization effect of different consonants upon the PA system. They were going there in a day or two. The capital city of Latvia. Riga. Riga. And he's the bloody agent. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm doing at the moment is more proofreading of the book and instead of just doing a rock biography a guy called Simon Gray recently let a book out called The Smoking Diaries I really really have fallen in love with that kind of writing Something I've learned from writing the book is that it wasn't particularly music, although it's the biggest thing in my life. It, it could have been any form of creativity. And I state in the book all the way through that I don't see creativity as a talent. I see creativity as a condition, a dangerous creative condition. And it's very similar to autism, I think. And as long as I'm writing something, or making something, I'm okay, I'm happy. the last week of the tour, you don't want it to end because you've become so relaxed. I mean, it really is therapy. You don't have to get up early. You don't have any stress. And you get to play music and you get to go to a nice place after and have a few beers. And you, you just latch into this really euphoric existence, you know? And you definitely come back from a tour looking a lot better than when you went out. Anyone who says it's hard is telling fibs. I heard a guitar player from the 30s called Charlie Patton. Um, he's all Delta Blues, man and his voice sounded like mine. That was the first thing that drew me to him was, good God, he's got a voice like mine, and he's made a record. Then I locked in on the, this sly guitar thing. I thought it was a violin. You know, the, the record was so old and bad recording. And plus it was like a satellite thing that the BBC used to do in them days, where it was live with Telstar or something. For one hour, you'd go to an American radio station. And you'd sit there and imagine what it was like. And I always had this idea it would be like Italy. I always had this idea you'd smell fabulous coffee and... Because they'd always tell you it was hot. So hot to me meant Italy. Because it wasn't a bit like Italy. But I thought this violin sound I thought it was a violin and I, I asked a lad who I used to take his amplifier to the gig for him. Um, in my dad's ice cream van. And he told me it was a slag guitar, there was a bottleneck on strings.
that was it. Yeah. Straight away about a Hoffner solid. It was £32. I've still got it. Oh, so far away. I hear that engine sing. Listen what it says. Get me on that track Get on board someday Now hear that whistle blow Yes, this is KGB watch, my friend. It's made at military company, Chistopol City, Tatarstan. I am looking for a blind man watch. Blind man? What, yeah. blind? Yeah. Yes, I have. Uh, where you yes, yes, lift I the lid? Yes, I have, my friend. Let's make it communist time, these blend people's glasses open inside yeah. and how many times people... How much do you want for that? Eight, my friend. Is. Eight? Eight thousand rubles. And how much is that in euros? Two thirty-five. Two hundred and thirty-five euros? All the watches, my friend, is 45, 60 years, this watch, my friend. I know, I have one. You have this one? Yeah. My friend, well, maybe you buy communist time, it's much cheaper, today everything expensive. Mm. How much you buy this one? I can give you 50 euros for that. My friend, here not Indonesia, not China. <laughs> it's Russia, a little much more expensive, my friend. Mm. Come. Okay. How much you buy together? Okay, you keep your price. Good deal. No for you, no for me. I'll give you 50 euros. No, this is not money, my friend. 50 euros. <laughs> 150 for the two. It's good. Give me 180. Come on. Okay, 180. 150. Done. My friend, no. George. <laughs> Come on, relax, George. You're one friend. Give me 10 euros more. Okay, 160. Good deal. 80, 80. 150, George. Okay, come on. 80, 80. Good deal for you, my friend. You're tough, George. You're hard, man, George. Yeah. This is fantastic. This is great. That was a bit fun, wasn't it? Yeah. But this means a lot to me. Memory. <laughs> well, I had one before and it, it eventually broke. And a Russian guy gave me it. And he was a blind man. And he gave me it. And he came from Russia to Helsinki before the wall came down to see the street. And he gave me the only thing he could give me was, was a watch. It always touched me that a government. A government that made watches for blind people can't have been all that bad. And what, what happens is, is you, you open it like that, and the, and the time is in Braille on the face. <laughs> Might get your zimmer. <laughs> well over. Chris has had that forever, really. When I first started with Chris, he just had these two guitars. Pinky, it's called. And the other one's bluey. They were before me. And the rest are just acquisitions along the way. I started doing Chris Rear in 1986, and before that, I was a guitar player in many different unsuccessful bands. <laughs> Chris wanted someone to go out to Australia who'd already been, you know, like, and was a bit experienced. So I got, I got the job and have been here ever since.
this is how bored we get. We're only into our second week and uh, we're now making up our own anthems for answering phones. Um, Sivan, I'm doing an interview. As I was saying, about gospel blues bass guitar playing. It's a, very, it's a rarity in this room. For the older songs, this is where the tours all start to become surreal. We've now got used to touring, and there's very little to fight about now. Um, I've given up trying to get every bead of sweat of what I want, and we're just cruising. And we all noticed today some papers came. And we're all staring at the newspapers at things that we might have talked about six weeks ago. Now, it could be any country in the world. It's quite amazing how irrelevant they all become so quickly. And you don't care, that's what's interesting. <laughs> Everyone's going, oh, I'll go home after that gig. And then suddenly you have to start leaving the mothership and you miss the German. Five odd years has been doing these shows. I've done nearly all, every Chris Rear show, apart from maybe one or two in all that time. It's a limbo feeling. Because it's the end of tour, you always get that feeling anyway. But because it's his last one, yeah, empty feeling. Feels quite empty. I don't know what to say. I really don't. I feel quite emotional. <laughs> it's quite, oh no. The whole tour has gone a lot better than anybody thought. It's a bit like winning a war, you know, because you left home in January and it's now nearly May. You've seen everything, you know. For me, this is a farewell tour of doing Julia, On the Beach, Road to Hell, the way we've always done it. But already now I'm on to the Memphis Fireflies. The next time you see Chris Ray, it'll be with the Memphis Fireflies. I drove myself completely crazy all the way through the tour, trying to see if I could mentally get to this point where I want the Memphis Fireflies to be. I still don't feel as if I've touched the nerve center of this thing that haunts me about gospel blues. But somewhere between the cotton fields and the sugar plantations, an Irish hymn in church and black African music, and there's something in that combination that has haunted me for 30 years. It's just there's something in my head and I hear it every night. And I still only think I'm starting to touch it. I feel as if I've got another 10 albums to get out. And that's how I'll be after this last gig, you know. <laughs> 